If the world was already becoming more fractured, divided, uncertain and worrisome, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has made that landscape vastly more troubled. Seismic, epoch-changing, chilling. You can choose your adjective. But today we can listen to somebody who has sat at the top table of global military and security issues, both real and strategized, fathoming these complexities. And he is here today in person with me in London. So I'm thrilled and honoured to have the former Chief of the Defence Staff, General Sir Nick Carter, as our guest on the Money Maze podcast. So Nick Carter, welcome. Simon, thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Well, I'm going to spare you the embarrassment of saying this, but you were the longest serving military chief since Lord Mountbatten, having spent nearly eight years in senior leadership, the first four as head of the army, followed by another three and a half in the top job, chief of defence staff, and only retired in November 2021. To set the scene, I hope that in today's conversation, we will be able to hear your perspectives on the Ukraine situation. And whilst that is centre stage, it's only one part of a brew of wider geopolitical turmoil. So we can move on to events and thoughts in China, the shifting sands of the Middle East, including Turkey and Iran, through to cyber risks, policy priorities, threats to our democracy from within and without, and much more. So many topics, I'm going to have to restrain myself. But first up, I mentioned in our chat a few weeks ago that I interviewed and was accepted with the Royal Green Jackets back in 1982. And if I had joined, which I didn't, as finance won that contest, you would have been my boss. I missed out. But also I noted that both of us failed our Oxbridge exams. So with the starting gun, I'd love to capture a glimpse of how your youth formed the man you became, born in Kenya and joined the army at 18. Yes, I mean, I I don't think I ever really set out to join the army, but... um... My father was very clear and unequivocal when I ploughed Oxbridge and it was, um, you're not going to Red Brick University again, do something constructive. Um, and as good luck would have it, uh, that was the army because he'd spent half his life in the army uh, and the Royal Green Jackets, as you say. Um, and then the idea was that I'd come out and get a professional qualification. Um, and indeed he teed all that up for me as well. But I discovered after three years that actually I was really rather enjoying it. So I extended for a bit and then decided um, to apply for regular commission, which I, I duly got. Um, and you might say the rest is history. I mean, I did vacillate with leaving before I got to the age of 30 and looked at law school and things like that. But um, the first Gulf War occurred and I had an interesting job. And of course, that encouraged me to stay for a bit longer. Um, and blow me down, it'll be 45 years come, uh, come retirement this year. Well, uh, impossible, but how would you condense four decades? Well, I think the thing that's been most striking probably is how uh, the world has changed uh, during those 45 years. And I've often said that um, the pace of change is greater than what we saw in the two world wars of the last century combined. And I think if you look at how change has accelerated over the course of the last 45 years and indeed how it continues to accelerate, I think change is probably the key uh, the key defining uh, piece of of that period. Um, if you think about it, we started um, when I was serving at the beginning in the Cold War, which was a, a bipolar world. The Cold War came to an end and we ended up with a, a unipolar world in which US hegemony was uh, all powerful. Um, and then, of course, as we step through um, the sort of, in parenthesis, war against terror, we've now ended up, as we step out of that, um, in a sense, in a multipolar world and a world of, of great competition. So, Nick, and you asked me to call you by your Christian name, but I feel it's a bit like calling my headmaster by his Christian name. But anyway, you have written presciently on this Russian danger and um, you actually wrote about Russia being a clear and present danger um, three years ago and advised that Britain should reduce its vulnerabilities. And, And what was it that you, I suppose, particularly noticed that maybe others either didn't want to or didn't? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to come across as being particularly prescient. I mean, I think I think I had the advantage um, when I was head of the army, of course, of um, of looking for uh, rationales for what the army should look like. And it's very important if you're if you're doing that, when you're thinking about how the army should be structured and how it should be trained, you quite clearly need to look at the threat as broadly as possible. And it certainly seemed to me if you went back to, let's say, 2007, when President Putin made a, a fairly big speech at the Munich Security Conference in which he renounced the whole idea of NATO enlargement and indeed railed against US hegemony and everything associated with that. It seemed to me uh, that from that moment onwards, we then had the uh, Russian invasion of Georgia 
uh, sorry, of, uh, yes, of Georgia. And then six years later, of course, the invasion of Crimea and then the uh, incursion into Syria, where they still are today. And then 2017, we see them appear in Libya. And of course, their behaviour has become ever more assertive. And of course, in 2018, we saw the shocking attempt to assassinate the Scripple family in Salisbury. So I think when you aggregate all of those things up, when I was um, speaking in January 18, it was just before the Scripple event in March of that year, I think, you know, one could see that Russia had um, remobilized. It was modernizing. It had some really quite interesting weaponry it was beginning to field. Uh, and when you combine that with assertive behavior, it did seem to me, and I've used this term uh, repeatedly, that they appeared to be the acute threat. And I always describe China as being more of a chronic challenge, but Russia is the acute threat. And, you know, I think that was that was how I saw it at the time. Um, and that hasn't changed my view. So we're going to get into the Ukraine situation, but there is an argument that Russia has been invaded four times since the 17th century and it's used the buffer countries around it as this, uh, you know, to protect them. Do you think that the West underestimated how important that is in the Russian psyche? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think if you go back to 2002, um, there was a you know a conference uh, which um, Lord Robertson, as the then Secretary General of NATO, chaired in Rome, um, and he told me the other day that you know he was standing on a platform with President Berlusconi and President Putin, and President Putin made it very clear um, that um, in his opinion, um, Russia was always portrayed and always appeared to be on the wrong side of history when it came to his relationship, certainly with Europe and with the West more broadly, and that he, President Putin, wanted to change that because he could see that the future was much more about uh, Russia being part of Europe and being part of the, the sort of firmament that the Western world represented. And he said that very publicly in 2002. And of course, if you go back and you look at what occurred in 1990, when there was a conversation in a corridor between James Baker and President Gorbachev at the time, who led the Soviet Union then about German reunification. Um, people have claimed that some deal was made. The answer is no deal was ever made. And of course, if you then go to 1994 and you see the <coughs> Budapest Declaration where you know the Ukrainians agreed to give up their nuclear weapons and that their territorial integrity would be assured by the West and of course by Russia as well. You know, I think there's a certain amount of rewriting of history going on here. And perhaps the killer point, I think, is that the reason it's called NATO enlargement rather than NATO expansion is because actually NATO doesn't invite anybody to join it. Countries apply to join NATO. Um, and indeed, in 2010, um, at the then NATO conference, um, Ukraine applied to join NATO and NATO refused its membership for all sorts of reasons. Um, so I don't think it is right and proper for President Putin to argue that um, what is happening in Ukraine now is the fault of NATO and the fault of NATO enlargement. NATO is a defensive alliance uh, and it doesn't invite people to join it. So I think um, he's attempting to rewrite history and of course his um, propaganda narrative is about trying to find excuses and pretexts for why he is now behaving as he is and we shouldn't believe any of it. Very clear. So let's maybe start with the high level question, which is how do you assess the situation right now? Um, I mean, I think first and foremost, you know, we need to be clear that however this ends, uh, and we'll come back to that, I'm sure, um, Putin has already lost. Um, and he's lost first and foremost, because if he tried to impose a puppet regime in Ukraine, it would have absolutely no legitimacy, um, and certainly not with the Ukrainian people. And indeed, one of the things that he's also managed to do very uh, stupidly is to unite Ukraine around a sense of Ukrainian nationhood, which is probably now more powerful than it's ever been. Uh, and that nationhood won't go away anytime soon and will certainly outlive President Putin. Secondly, of course, um, if he is going to impose a puppet regime on Ukraine, he's going to have to occupy the country and a country of 41 million people, although people are now clearly leaving for obvious reasons, and a country in geographic terms, the largest country in Europe, you know, he'll probably need half a million troops to to occupy that country. And it will become a very unpleasant um, insurgency guerrilla campaign if he does do that. And it will be very expensive to him in blood and treasure and something he, I just simply don't think he, he'll be able to afford. Third, then, you know, he's managed to unite uh, the international community against him. Uh, and he's done that much more successfully than um, NATO or the European Union have done in their mm -hmm. history, probably. 
you know, that's a very stupid place to be because in tandem, he's managed to isolate himself from the international community as well. And that's going to be expensive in terms of sport, culture, the economy, and so on and so forth. Um, and it's going to take a very long time for anybody ever to trust him again. So that sense of isolation is probably going to be around for a very, very long time. And then, of course, the question that is very difficult for us as outsiders to answer is that it, he does appear to have mobilised dissent against his regime inside his own country. Now, how that evolves remains to be seen, and it will be extremely difficult for those who wish to um, mount a campaign against him to do so because of the very repressive measures that his government has now put in place. But there is quite clearly dissent in his country now. So the answer is, whichever way you look at it, he's lost. But that's a dangerous place for him to be because like the cornered rat that we gather he might have bumped into in St. Petersburg as a young man, rats tend to fight back. And I think that's the thing we all need to be watching very carefully now. So that really leads into my next question, which is what do you think is going on in his mind? Well, I, I personally don't think that um, he's mad. I mean, I think he's a rational human being. Uh, I think that people have often said that, you know, you, you, you just need to listen to what he says and read what he writes um, to understand where he's coming from. And of course, um, last summer in July, he wrote that essay on the historic relationship between Russia and Ukraine. And he feels profoundly, I think, that Russia, Ukraine and, and Belarus are very much, you know, three countries that frankly share the same history and legacy and are better off united and together. So he feels very strongly about that. And I think what we're seeing is his his sense of sort of um, passion for that belief. Um, and of course, I think what we're also seeing as a man who's been in power now for 22 years, um, as a result of that, I think he probably feels he's invincible. Uh, there's a sense of megalomania, perhaps, in some of his more recent pronouncements and a sort of um, messianic sort of way of speaking, which is slightly scary. And because of all of that, I don't think that um, he probably has many people around him who speak truth to power. So I think there's a slight sense of isolation about him. And I'm speculating, but I suspect even those who are brave enough to tell him uh, that he was not going to find his army being welcomed with open arms in Ukraine uh, were believed. Um, so I think that um, you know he's believing his own propaganda. And of course, that's a very dangerous place to be, as we have seen over the last first week or so of this week, week or so of this war, because, of course, his army has not been greeted as liberators. And the upshot of that is that the whole plan was based upon fundamentally flawed assumptions and no good ever comes of a military plan that's based on flawed assumptions. So I get the geopolitical miscalculations are immense. Have there been some military on the ground miscalculations from the from the get go um, about how he expected this war to be executed? Well, I think he clearly set some political objectives which look like they are completely uh, impossible um, to be translated into reasonable and sensible military objectives. And we've seen in many cases in history where the political objectives are out of alignment with the military objectives, um, that will only end badly. And of course, um, you know, the political objectives, which we assume uh, in maximalist terms are about uh, subjugating Ukraine and putting in a puppet regime, and perhaps in less maximalist terms might be about subsuming the Donbass and maybe the coast of the Sea of Azov to link Russia to Crimea and so on and so forth, maybe even seize all of the land to the east of the river Dnieper. I don't know. But these political objectives are probably uh, unrealisable in military terms. Um, so that's the first problem. Then I think it comes back to the assumption that was clearly made that um, his army would be greeted as liberators. Um, and of course, if you think you're going to be greeted as liberators and you also keep it very quiet from your army what it might have to do, the psychology when... Uh, the leading elements of that army suddenly get a bloody nose means that it's very difficult to um, persuade those soldiers to fight in the way that they probably need to fight. Um, and it's been a very rude shock, uh, both in terms of the way they were sustaining themselves with logistics. And we've seen that the way the planning was conducted with, you know, a lot of um, combat power being passed down single routes. Uh, they've been unlucky with the weather. It's very mild. So off road, it's very muddy and difficult to passage. So for all those sorts of reasons, they haven't had the the right force organisation um, to be able to deal with what has become, you know, a fight uh, rather than a liberation. Um, and of course, you know, describing the thing as a special military operation, as he did in his uh, pronouncement um, the week before last, bottom line is that um, it's turning out to be a war. And that means that they're going to have to think really hard about how they um, reorganise their military effort and be able to be able to fight a war. And we're beginning to see what that looks like. Uh, during the course of this recent week.
I think it was Napoleon uh, who said that the success of any campaign was one quarter attributable to numbers and material and three quarters to morale. And although I think there's been an assumption that many of his troops are battle hardened because of you know, the Middle East, etc., do you suspect that that isn't the case? I don't know. I mean, we're hearing, aren't we, lots of reports of um, young conscripts being completely amazed by what they've found in Ukraine. Uh, and as a result, you know, we're hearing about desertions and people voluntarily surrendering and so on and so forth. So, yes, I mean, I think I think the moral component is important in all of this. And we military, when we're trying to measure um, the, the fighting effectiveness of armed forces, talk about uh, the components of fighting power. And that's the conceptual at the top of the pyramid and the physical and the moral. And what we're seeing here very clearly is that the moral component uh, is very powerful on the Ukrainian side, you know, most impressively led and marshaled by uh, President Zelensky, who's managed to get this sense of Ukrainian nationhood at the heart of how the fight is being conducted, whether those are regular forces or irregular forces or even the civilians who are putting their shoulder to the wheel as well, um, versus, you know, a, a Russian army that already appears to be demoralized psychologically unprepared for what it's now having to confront um, and frankly questions about its endurance and its ability to be able to continue to fight uh, in the way that it'll be required and this fight's going to get worse rather than better I fear for everybody. So I'm going to quote you again escalation can lead to miscalculation what would you be advising? Well I mean quite clearly the, the most fundamental thing we can do at the moment is to really reinforce the unity of our NATO alliance and our broader alliance uh, across the international community. And then fundamentally, we need to try and contain this. Um, we we don't want this war to become a regional conflict or for that matter, a, a more global conflict. So trying to contain it is fundamental. But that's going to require some really difficult choices because, of course, as we saw during the Bosnian thing, the Balkan thing in the 90s, um, you know, when you start to see some really ugly images emerging uh, from these sorts of um, uh, conflicts and crises. Um, public opinion has a say in what occurs. And I fear we're going to see some really unpleasant and ugly and terrifying images beginning to emerge. So how you contain all of this is fundamentally where, you know, our, our political leadership, our states, men and women have got to be on this. Um, and I think, you know, there is this extraordinary um, reawakening that's occurred in the Western world. I mean, I think extraordinary um, hearing on the 28th of February, um, Chancellor Schulz's speech and announcement in Germany that he was going to raise German defence spending to 2% mm. and in a sense focus Germany on the, on the threat in a way that um, you know, we haven't seen for many, many years. Um, th th these are really seismic changes uh, in the way the, the world is now thinking and the way, of course, the world will evolve. Um, so I think, you know, we are, we are having this sort of reawakening about what we stand for. And if going back to um, why perhaps President Putin has lost. I mean, a lot of autocrats across the world will be looking at this with some interest um, because perhaps the West has realised what the West stand for, stands for uh, and we've been woken a bit out of our, out of our slumber uh, and maybe Francis Fukuyama's prediction is going to come true. So that, of course, uh, really takes us to, to NATO. And so what, what will this do for NATO and its future direction? Well, I think it's um, you know, now um, much more likely that uh, all uh, NATO members will step up to the plate uh, uh, and raise their defence spending to the minimum of 2%, which was what was prescribed uh, back in 2014 at the NATO conference in Cardiff. Um, whether or not, of course, 2% is enough, I think a lot of people are reflecting on, given how the world is going to look um, after, you know, what, however this thing evolves. So I think, you know, obviously we're going to see more defence spending. I think we're also going to see um, NATO perhaps realising that um, readiness is going to be important again uh, at a level that we haven't seen probably since the uh, days of the Cold War. Um, and that means that, you know, there'll be need to understand how you can mobilise, to understand the sort of war stocks that you need to have readily available to you. I mean, we began to learn some big lessons, didn't we, through COVID about supply chains and resilience. So I think one will see a lot of people protecting supply chains and thinking hard about resilience uh, as distinct from efficiency. Uh, mm. So I think that'll be, you know, an important change. Um, and I guess uh, shares in defence industry are going up as we speak, Simon, uh, in your world. So I, I think we'll see a bit of that. Um, I suspect we're also going to see um, probably quite a thought given to to how, what NATO's posture 
uh, needs to look like in, in, in military and political terms in relation to this threat? I mean, are we going to see a new Iron Curtain descending in Europe? Um, are we going to see the need for people to be forward deployed in order to provide the sort of reassurance to those countries who are nearer Russia um, and to deter Russia, obviously? Um, it's interesting, isn't it, that um, two neutral countries in Sweden and Switzerland have stepped up to the plate in the former to supply arms and in the latter to get behind the remarkable sanctions that have been imposed from the 28th of February onwards. And then I think, you know, Finland, you know, I'm told there was a recent poll in Finland where the majority thought that joining NATO might not be such a bad thing to do. Mm. So I think I think you can see that, um, you know, the whole NATO thing is going to be much more um, much more on the front burner than perhaps it's been in the past. And, you know, if one was you know, thinking about with a NATO as people wear with an H rather than an I, of course, you know, even a year or two ago, and you'll remember that um, President Macron described it as brain dead before the London conference a couple of years ago. I think the reality now is, is that it's quite obvious that NATO has got a very, very important role in assuring the stability of the Western world. Right. So before we leave Russia and Ukraine... Is there some compromise that you can envisage? Um, I, I can't see anything at the moment. Um, number of thoughts, really. I mean, I think, you know, first and <clears throat> obvious thought is this as, as a soldier is that um, all wars ultimately end in a conversation. And this will end in a conversation as well. I think we need to recognise that um, this is not going to be a solution that we impose on Ukraine. The Ukraine has got to be at the front end of this conversation. Um, you know, they are fighting for their country and they're fighting for freedom at the moment and our hearts go out to them, but ultimately they need to be the determinants of what any conversation or compromise may lead to. Uh, we can su only support them in that. I think that um, there will be some big questions asked about how that is brokered and negotiated. And I personally think that countries like China have got a very important role to play in this. I mean. I don't think China likes instability. You know, it very much depends upon a global economy that is essentially stable uh, and which gives them the opportunity to trade. Um, and if they see um, globalisation being knocked in the way that um, this crisis is obviously doing, that will worry them. So I think they've got a big motivating reason to try and bring the parties to the table and to find a negotiated solution. So it's going to take somebody who I think um, President Putin respects uh, to try and find a way through this. Um, and, you know, I hope that somebody will step up to the plate to bring the parties to the table and get talking as soon as possible. Um, but the trouble with war is you have to probably fight a bit in order to get into a position where the parties are exhausted and are therefore best prepared to have that conversation. And I fear that is going to go on for a bit longer yet. So you've moved to China, which was my next question. So maybe uh, high level, how do you assess China's geopolitical and military ambitions? Um, I mean, I think, you know, first and foremost, I think China believes, if you go back into, you know, several hundred years, that, that, that they have a historic right of entitlement to be a great power in this world. And of course, um, the way that their economic development has gone since they joined the World Trade Organization all those years ago has been only upwards. And it's going to continue to do that. Uh, and, and, and my judgment is that, of course, as everybody will predict, is that China is going to be, you know, an equal great power to uh, the United States um, within the course of the next decade. Now, I, I personally think that, you know, China wants to do that in a peaceful way. Uh, I don't believe that it um, you know, wants to wants to bring greater um, instability to the world than what we've seen already. The challenge, of course, is that um, China has a different system. Um, and I think, you know, what we see is a country that, you know, espouses um, a, a way of life uh, that's less free than the way of life that we espouse. Um, and of course, you know, they are governed by you know, an autocratic regime, uh, which is very different to what we all stand for in the, the Western or democratic world. Um, so I think that, you know, there's going to be this, this, this clash of values as China um, becomes stronger. And it's how you manage that uh, clash, that competition of values, which is challenging. And my own view is, is that a lot of this is going to manifest itself in the way that China's technology begins to be embraced within the world. And I think that the way we're headed is it will be very likely that there will be parallel models of technology. Um, I've talked a lot about 
uh, Belt and Road, but particularly about the digital Silk Road, um, which I think is of more interest than the Belt and Road Initiative. And I think if you look at some of the evidence, you know, China's global positioning system, Beidou, or Big Dipper as it's known, you know, is now found to be accurate in more capital cities in the world than the US-sponsored GPS, so Asia Today was was saying a couple of years ago. And of course, um, global positioning technology is at the heart of smart cities. And of course, if you go down that direction, that gives China the first step in creating smart cities, which if you then link to 5G technology, where they're quite clearly leading the world, and you bring in some of their surveillance technology, their video recognition technology, and all the other things that go with it, I think you could very easily see how their values could be translated through this technology into those values being imposed on countries in the world, which perhaps we might have thought were oriented traditionally more in our direction. So I think you can see how, you know, parallel technological models um, and values are going to be really at the heart of how this competition evolves. And I personally think it's, um, it's dangerous to talk about a new Cold War or anything like that. What we need to be talking about is how we create communities of interest um, of different countries around different interests that ultimately can help uh, steer this thing in a way that is non-confrontational and in which um, we can learn to live more effectively together. So many of the Money Maze podcast listeners make weekly investment decisions under pressure and against the backdrop of uncertainty from portfolio managers and asset allocators to CIOs and CEOs. And hindsight will judge them and determine their promotion, compensation, self-worth, etc. What have you learned about decision-making under pressure that applies beyond the military? Um, I mean, I think, I think for all leaders in this world, I mean, we, we talked earlier in this conversation about the pace of change being um, being very fast and, of course, almost exponentially increasing every year. And therefore, I think that, um, for my mind, the most important characteristic of, of strategic leadership um, is the ability to um, to listen and to learn. You know, that silly old phrase about every day being a school day is, is, is relevant in all of this, because only if you listen and you learn will you be adaptable. And of course, what we military learn, and we're seeing this as this crisis plays out in Ukraine, is that whatever you might have expected that war to look like when it starts, it won't be what you predicted, because you can't predict the future character of warfare, really. And that therefore means that adaptability has to be the key criteria. Um, And that means you have to train people to be adaptable. And I think it also, if you want people to be those who will listen and learn, that requires a bit of humility because it also requires you to admit that you're wrong. Um, and I think that that's a pretty fundamental characteristic of, of strategic leadership. I think the other thing about it is, given that you know the information domain is you know, what it now is, and I talked about um, us doing things which everything plays out now in a fishbowl, I think because of the information domain, you need to recognise that you know, the, if, if you want decisions to be realised, um, you can't necessarily expect it to happen automatically. You have to shape the environment for those decisions to be realised and the audience needs to be shaped for all of that. So I think I think for strategic leadership, this, this sense of shaping is important. And fundamentally, all of it is underpinned by having the best possible quality of advice, insight and understanding. You know, and every time we've got it wrong on battlefields in my career, it's because we didn't have adequate insight and understanding at the front end of what we were doing. Um, and I think, you know, that will be a lesson that I'm sure the Russian general, general staff is reflecting on at the moment. Mm. Uh, Peter Frankopan, author of The Silk Roads, uh, head of global history at Oxford, who has been on our uh, show, actually in an interchange with him, raised the question, and I'm going to quote it, he says, what are the UK's main advantages in a world that looks a lot more hostile and challenging? Um I mean, I guess he's asking about across the UK. I mean, I think that you know, um, it's certainly the case in in, in the in, in military terms, but I think more broadly uh, in terms of our national psyche is that I think we do produce very innovative people, um, and I think that um, innovation in a world where adaptability is going to be a fundamental characteristic is something that we should be doubling down on. And I think the ability to to decentralise, to give people their head to allow that innovation and imagination to flourish um, is where I think we've got an opportunity to double down. I also think that um, as a nation, we we are, we are have a set of values um, and we have a set of principles and we have um, 
a legislative system that we can all be pretty proud of, I think. And I think that makes us into a very secure and stable society. And I think that in a world where it's going to become much more complex and dynamic, where I guess the defining condition is going to be instability, then having that stability in your society is, is, is fundamental. And I think that has to be one of our national strengths and is one of the reasons why I think you know, a lot of foreigners want to come and list, live in our country. And then I think the other characteristics, which if you push the British public, I think is right at the heart of them, is the generosity of spirit. Mm. And I think in this world, generosity of spirit is going to be quite an important ingredient as we look forwards. And I you know, hope that we have that generosity of spirit towards the Ukrainian population over the course of the next few weeks and months. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. We all have to think about our pensions and our investment decisions, and um, you are like uh, many others. But how are you thinking about where you would deploy your own savings over the coming years? Well, I'm in the ironic position, of course, of not really having to worry about where my pension comes from because um, <laughs> it's given to me by a, gov- a grateful government, um, and it's generously in- it's generally indexed generously in, in uh, index linked as well. But if I were in that position, I mean, I, I think, you know, energy is a very interesting sector at the moment, how that's going to evolve. Uh, and I think sort of um, betting on some of that is obviously going to be an important angle to what we do. Uh, I think, you know, commodities generally, um, I think that's going to be interesting. I think, you know, over the next five to 10 years, the defence sector is going to take on more of a more important role than perhaps it did in the past. But I also think, as it's always been, I think innovation and technology uh, at the moment has got to be surely at the heart of what we're trying to do because, you know, however unstable, unstable this world is and, and does become for still further, you know, it'll be those who've got a, a an edge somewhere and that edge is going to be found from technology that'll be at the heart of what they do. And of course, people are at the heart of that. So education is going to be important. Mm. <laughs> uh, so I've got a few closing questions. Um, you've done a huge job. What's the next challenge? Um, I think getting some balance in one's life. Um, I mean, I am, um, you know, I've, um, the last 10 years I've been very busy. And I think if you do that, um, you know, your, your focus inevitably becomes rather a selfish focus um, on, on, on the job and what you're doing. And there are, you know, there are, there are people I care a lot about in my life who I've not invested as much time in as I should have done. So I think, um, you know, being a slightly more generous to my family and my friends and being more present for them, I think is a really important thing to do. Um, and then I suppose, you know, I would like to, um, I'd, I'd like to maintain my, my, my sort of interest and, and stimulation in what I've learned over the last 10 years. Um, and I think if one can pass some of that on to others um, to help perhaps them um, create a better world, um, then surely that's got to be a good thing to do as well. So I suspect a sort of a portfolio of things around the notion of strategic advice and strategic thought, if I can do that, would be probably where I would um, see myself headed. Well, I'm sure there are a lot of organisations that could benefit from your experience and insights. What's your most important daily habit today? And what was it when you were in the army? Um, I've always made my bed the moment I've got out of it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I, and I think um, taking some exercise every day, I think is important. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I think having a routine, having a rhythm to what you do is important. Uh, I think that it's been interesting for me transitioning from a, a world where um, Microsoft, Microsoft Office had scheduled every 30 minutes of your day to a world where you're responsible for scheduling what you want to do. <laughs> it has been interested in, interesting in terms of trying to maintain a routine and a rhythm to your daily life. Um, all of a sudden, weekends take on less relevance, don't they? Um, which is an extraordinary position to be in. But I think having a routine, having a rhythm, um, which starts with making your bed when you get out of it in the morning, but then actually also, you know, I think having an open mind um, and taking a bit of exercise. I think those are the things that matter to me. As I play this podcast around the house, I'm going to accidentally have a repeat function about making your bed so my three children can, uh, can not, not, not avoid hearing it several times. What advice would you give to uh, young men and women thinking about joining the services? Um, I mean, it's not for everybody. Um, I mean, I think, um, you know, what I, what I admire so much about my children's generation is that um, I think they want to give something back. I think they care very much about the world in a way that I'm not sure our generation did. Mm-hmm. I think we were more 
more egotistical in terms of what we were after. So I admire that. And I think if you do want to put something back, I think that a career in the um, armed forces, um, which has service at the heart of what it does, um, is a very good career for people um, because that sense of service and duty automatically means that you're thinking about others. And therefore, in thinking about others, I think you probably will make the world a better place. So I would I would thoroughly recommend it for those who want to add value in the world. There's this great book that we've quoted, so I'm going to ask you the question that they pose, which is, if you could tell us just one thing. Um, always try and see things from the other person's perspective. Very good advice. And and in terms of managing people, what characteristics, and I use that word rather than qualities, do you think make the best leaders? I think one has to be, if I may be pedantic again, I, think, <laughs> I wouldn't use the word managing. I, I would try and use the word leading. Because I think, as you'd know, the motto of Sandhurst, where our army officers are trained, is serve to lead. And I think that um, that mantra, serve to lead, is at the heart of the way that you should lead the people who work for you. And that means that you need to know them, you need to understand them, um, and you need to care for them. And I think if you can do that, then they will want to work for you and you will end up with a much more uh, productive organisation than you would do otherwise. Yeah, that's very well said. My three final questions. Given the choice of anyone in the world, who would you want to have as a dinner guest? Can it be somebody who's no longer with us? Yes. <laughs> um, Nelson Mandela. Right, right. And interestingly, you aren't the first person who has uh, has wanted that, which is uh, which, which goes to say what a powerful individual he was. What would constitute today a perfect day? A subpar round of golf, round a great golf course. <laughs> well, between Will Campbell and myself, I think we might be able to arrange, um, you know, a, a, an option or two. Um, and finally, what are you most grateful for? Um the support I've had all my life, a lot of my life from my wife and my children. Well, Nick, we could go on and I could go on and you'll be happily let, knowing that I'm going to let you go. But I have taken so much from this um, and so much that we'll put some of it into the show notes. Uh, so excited about this release. Um, I've definitely been, you know, looking forward to anticipating this, you know, for several weeks. Of the two principal conclusions I'm going to take away, uh, apart from the recommendation to read a book which is called War in 140 Characters, is that, number one, I thought you give a very balanced assessment of China and its position and how significant a role it can play in the, you know, with the current and the, you know, in the future events. And that great advice, which is listen, learn and adapt. And I'm not too old to benefit from that. So General Sir Nick Carter, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Simon.